point. But we could watch that too. Um, all right, can everyone see that? Yes. All right. Okay, sounds good. Well, I will get started. Um, thank you all for being here. I'm sure you have a lot of other important things to do, um, but I'm happy to be here, happy to talk to a grad SWE group just because grad SWE was such a big part of my life um, during graduate school and similar groups during my postdoc. Um, and I'm also excited to talk about this particular topic because it's something that I think I have informal conversations about um, with new graduate students um, and undergrads all the time, but it's not something that I've ever um, formally talked about. So I am looking forward to sharing it and feel free, you know, I'm gonna, it's fairly gonna be fairly informal. I'll try to be really open. Um, there should be plenty of time for questions, but if you have any questions in the middle that like you absolutely want me to clarify, feel free to stop me from talking. Um, all right, uh, so I wanted to start by sharing a little bit of my history and where I'm coming from. Um, I, with the caveat, you know, I, I do appreciate you reaching out and saying like, oh, like you've published so many things, but for me, I still feel like I'm fairly new in this game. Um, I've been publishing, I guess, in, in journals for about seven years, um, which as we all know in the journey of academia is, is not a super long period of time. Um, but I'm happy to share kind of lessons that I've learned in that time um, that I'm thinking about going forward as I advance in my career. Um, so I thought that the most effective way to, before I, you know, share my tips, because I tried to reduce it all into a series of tips, um, was to walk you through kind of what my paper trail has looked like over the past seven years, um, because I think that that will be effective as I, I share the story. Um, so I started graduate school in 2012 at the University of Illinois. Um, I had done undergraduate research at Cornell and um, you know, I had like contributed to a few different papers, but I didn't end up, you know, because of like changes and stuff that happened to the research, I didn't end up being um, an author on any of the things that I worked on during my undergraduate uh, research. Uh, so I started grad school at the University of Illinois in 2012 and in the spring of 2013, so my second semester of grad school, there were a couple opportunities for where senior postdocs and grad students had been asked to write reviews. Um, and they were kind of like, I'm busy. <laughs> um, so they basically were handed off, you know, sections of it to me. And, you know, they actually offered it to a few other graduate students at the time, and, and they didn't want to do it. They didn't take on the effort. And um, I'm glad I did, because even though they're not like super highly cited reviews or anything, it was like a really good easy process into learning how to um, write certain sections of reviews without having to go through the whole um, publishing process. So those are my first sort of published works where I contributed, I think just a paragraph for one of them and for another one, almost half of the review paper. Um, but it was also a really great way for me to get to know my field. Um, so that was good. Um, and then the next thing that happened was that I was working on um, a project in high resolution 3D printing with living cells. Um, and it was tough, like it wasn't going that great, to be honest, like first year of grad school, I'm sure you can all relate. Um, it was just going very slow. I had classes, I need to think about quals, like it was just not really going anywhere. Um, and there was another project that another grad student that was working on um, where she was kind of stuck because she was a bioengineer by training and she needed a little more of like a mechanical engineer's perspective. Um, so my graduate advisor was like, why don't you take a pause from your stuff or like in addition, help her out um, with her project. Um, so I, and her project was in making these uh, locomotive soft robots that were powered by tissue engineered skeletal muscle. So I helped her out with her project doing a lot of like mechanical testing and design materials testing and computational modeling. Um, and then when that paper was accepted because she was a year ahead of me so she had a body of work going, um, I actually ended up being co first author on that work. Um, that gave me some time to kind of refresh my brain. Um, so I was able to wrap up that 3D printing project by 2015, which ended up being a, a first author um, paper. Um, and I also had a collaboration ongoing with a lab at MIT. Um, and this was because, so the, 
the postdoc who offered me, you know, like write a paragraph for my review, when he left the lab, he had some projects that he needed to wrap up, which was a collaboration with MIT. And he was like, hey, you worked on that review. Why don't you finish doing all of the 3D printing work for, for that paper? So I did, and then I ended up being second author there um, and also writing a, a book chapter with my advisor because he knew by that time that I was uh, a fairly um, competent writer and I, you know, he's a very busy guy, department head, now he's Dean. So he was like, take care of this. Um, 2016, uh, I ended up actually uh, making a couple changes to the trajectory of my research. After that 3D printing, couple 3D printing papers, I realized my real interest was in this tissue engineering space, uh, which was that project that I was just hopping onto in the beginning. Um, so I ended up switching tracks to, to publish more in that space, ended up having a couple first author papers in 2016 and 2017 on that work. And then also some additional things where, um, you know, we taught a class based on that work. So I had like an education focused paper. Uh, Nature Protocols wanted to publish like the full design of how to do it. So I ended up doing a paper on that. And then other people in the lab started adapting that protocol for different applications or different things. Um, like a former undergrads became grad students. They were working on it or grad students in other labs. So I tacked on some of these sort of co-first and third author positions. Um, and, you know, as you, progress in your career and start being recognized as more of a, a expert in your discipline, um, you do just end up getting invited to, to write more reviews. So I graduated in 2016. So you can see that in 2017, there's a lot of papers and reviews just being wrapped up. Like there's a reason that this was the most um, publications I've had in a year. It's because I was finally done with my PhD and just getting everything out. Um, then you see like a drop, right? Which again, shouldn't surprise you because I started my postdoc. I was working on two completely different projects that were both in animal models um, and very complex, one large animal model and another small animal model, but in the brain. So these things just take a certain amount of time. So I worked on a couple reviews as well as a general audience book um, for MIT Press, which I'll talk about a little bit more later. Um, and both of those uh, projects culminated in a first author papers, one at the end of 2019 and one just a few months ago. Um, and now I'm working um, on a third paper for my postdoc, which will probably come out maybe sometime next year, but who can tell, um, depending on whether labs shut down or not. Um, so you can kind of see that, you know, even though it looks like maybe there's not too many takeaways from the story, I think the main takeaway is that there were a lot of times where I had several projects going in parallel. Um, and this is the way that I kind of mitigate risk. I think about um, papers as kind of the way a financial investor would think about diversifying their portfolio. So there are times when you're working on a lot of different projects, one might hit a road bump, you can take a pause and work on something else. And then maybe there's some skills or things that you can translate back to this. And even if one hits a permanent roadblock that never goes anywhere, which there are papers here, I should have marked, of stuff I just gave up on because it wasn't working or the collaboration was taking too long or like I put it off for a later date to do during my faculty. And that's totally fine too, because the nice thing about diversifying your portfolio is that even if a few things succeed, even a half of the things succeed, um, you can keep publishing and, and keep up the record. Because the most important thing, especially if you're thinking about going to academia is to show some sort of um, consistent trajectory, which can be very hard to do with research because it is so unpredictable. So those are that's kind of my paper trail, but I do want to share a little bit of um, kind of the main takeaways other than this diversifying portfolio takeaway. And the first one is going to be fairly obvious. Um, it's just don't shy away from the hard work, especially the earlier you are um, during your career. I think that the most amount of time I have spent in lab um, in my career was probably the first two years of graduate school where I got absolutely zero papers out of it. Um, and that's because I was just learning a lot of things about how to structure experiments so that you get the kind of data that you want, learning how to pipette. I mean, it's just all of these things take practice and time and I, you cannot, you cannot get away from how many hours that takes. Um, so I think in the beginning, you have to be willing and part of a PhD is that it's a marathon, right? So you have to be willing to take that time to know that you're gonna be working really, really hard on something with pretty much very little or no um, positive outcome. Um, and that can be very difficult. Um, but when you do have that moment where something finally works, it's super worth it. Um, so I wanted to show this video because this video is definitely that moment for me. 
Um, so what happening, what's happening in this video here is that it's really zoomed in. This little worm-like thing is a few millimeters long. Um, it's a flexible 3D printed skeleton around which there are these tissue engineered rubber bands of skeletal muscle. And we genetically engineered that muscle to be responsive to light. So when you flashlight on it, it should contract. And ideally, um, you should get this robot essentially to move. Um, of course, the video is not going to play. It never does. Anyway. Um, Maybe I'll restart my PowerPoint at the end of this and show you. But the important thing um, for me for this video was that this, I could not get this experiment to work um, for literally. Oh, there it is. Never mind. I could not get this experiment to work for the first three years of my PhD. I made hundreds, maybe thousands of that robot. Um, and I remember. Like I would tweak every single thing. I'd be like, maybe 30 microliters of this instead of 35. Like maybe if I did this, maybe if I use those tweezers, maybe if I buy a different dish, what if I add more sugar into this solution? I tried everything and it took forever. And this video, I finally got it while in a dark room at 3 a.m. in the morning on a Sunday night, Saturday night, actually, because I remember my friends were out. Um, and I was just like, why is this my life? Why am I here? Why isn't it working? And then when the robot finally started twitching and walking, I literally fell on the gross lab floor, like crying because I was so happy. Um, and as much as, you know, I've had other really hard experiments and other tough problems and things that have worked out over the years, but that is the moment that sticks out to me the most because it was the first time that, you know, I stuck with something for an extended period of time and it actually worked out. That being said, another thing that I've learned over the years is that there was a time I would have given up on this um, if it had, hadn't worked because you can't just keep, you know, sometimes the science just isn't there, like the physics isn't there, the tools aren't there, you can't make something happen if it's ahead of its time um, or it just can't be done. Um, and so there are projects where I've had these moments of not working, not working, not working. And then either I couldn't come up with an idea that was sufficiently different from what I tried before, or there were other projects that were going well. And so I was like, why am I wasting my time on this? So I've learned to kind of judge from my experience when I should stick with something and when I should prune, but it's definitely kind of an art. Um, and I will, I, I think for each of you, that'll come at a different time. Um, so that's the kind of obvious advice. Um, and now maybe some advice that's a little bit more um, tailored to how I work, um, but might also be helpful to you. So the second thing that I do is that I plan each paper that I'm going to write um, well ahead of time. And I don't just mean like, what is my hypothesis and what am I testing? Um, I literally, even if it is the very, very start of a paper, like of a project, it might be two years, three years from publication, I write out what the figures are going to be. And as you get older and have more experience in this, it gets easier to do that. In the beginning, it can be very complex. Um, and I struggle a lot when I tell other grad students and undergrad students, I see them struggling a lot because they're like, I don't know what to put. I, I don't know how to plan this. I don't know what it'll be because I think they're almost afraid to write down something that won't happen. And I'm kind of like, who cares? Like nobody else is gonna see this draft other than you. So just write it out. And the reason that it helps me is not only to know the whole um, story that I'm trying to tell, but it also tells me what I should do every day when I go into lab. Something that I struggled with a lot as a first and second year grad student is that I would just show up to lab and be like, hmm, what should I do today? And then I would kind of just do an experiment without really thinking like, what is the question I'm answering? Do I have enough of a sample size to like draw reasonable statistical conclusion? I didn't think about any of those things. But when I started doing this, like writing out the figure outline ahead of time, I knew exactly, I'd be like, today I'm coming in. I know that I don't have the data for figure 1B. And I went and I would do figure 1B that day. And of course, it doesn't turn out, um, you know, exactly how you planned, but you would be surprised at how often um, this does. So this is a, for example, an outline that I wrote in 2017. Um, and a figure that I published in 2020 for this paper. Um, and so I have here something about like we should, there's a, a ninofluidic pump that I was designing that was actuated by these wires made out of a shaped memory alloy. And I said, oh, we should optimize how many numbers of how many wires around the tube result in the best flow. So that ended up over here. It's not 1A, it's 1E. Wire tension, that's over here. Tube inner diameter, that's over here. Passive and active check valve, I ended up moving to the supplementary figures and then actually cutting from the manuscript because the reviewers didn't want it. Wire diameter, which ended up moving to a supplemental figure also, and wire on-off time, which is up here. So surprisingly, 
like it really helped me go through every day and actually figure out what experiments I was doing, but a lot of them actually ended up in the final paper. So it's been like a really good structure, at least for me, um, for keeping myself on target and not doing experiments that are unnecessary or not thinking about, you know, for this, I know that for each wire, I need to do four or five samples of each condition. And so I knew that and I planned it ahead of time. Very helpful. Um, similarly, that works really well when you're doing these experiments on your own, but sometimes um, you're going to be doing experiments with a whole bunch of other people that need to be coordinated. And you should be, um, regardless of your field. I'm in, you know, I make biomedical implants, so I, in essence, have to work with very multidisciplinary teams. I work with material scientists, electronical engineers, mechanical engineers, um, computer scientists, chemists biologists and clinicians. So like they're all over the place. Um, and so coordinating all of these people is very helpful. Um, it's also very helpful for the impact of the paper um, because not only, you know, I've talked so far about how do you get a lot of papers out in a certain period of time, but also getting more impactful papers out. The key thing is that no matter how smart you are, you are only as smart as one person. Um, and if you have 10 people who are equally smart helping you on stuff that you don't have to learn or don't have to do that experiment yourself because they're the expert on it, it will happen faster and it will always be a better paper. There's never going to be a paper that 10 people can do that one person can do better. Um, well, maybe there's a few exceptions, but I would say on average, that's, that's, that's a rule. Um, so for example, here is um, a project that I worked on that was published uh, at the end of 2019, um, which involved, you know, I made a new material, I turned it into an implantable device, and then I was implementing it in the gastrointestinal tract of pigs. And so it requires things like a material scientist um, to work on the mechanical characterization of the materials. Um, we needed a mechanical engineering design team to actually make the implant device. We need an electronical engineering design team to make some of the um, LEDs that we were interfacing with the part. And then we needed some veterinary technicians and surgeons who were actually doing the surgery in pigs. So it required a whole bunch of people to tell this great story and put this whole paper together. And the only way that I could keep all of these people on track, because each of them is working on a million different projects, um, was to essentially make a work plan or a spreadsheet on Google Drive that I just shared with all of them. And I was like, similar to the figures um, I showed you before, but instead of saying figure 1A, figure 1B, I was more specific, like here's exactly what we need to do. Here's when we're starting it, here when we're finishing it, here's who's responsible for it. Even if other people weren't responsible, I put what I was doing to show that I was also engaged and spending time on this project. Um, and then a status of whether it was like complete or in progress. Um, and so this ended up working out really, really well for our team, especially as um, Elise at MIT and in our lab, we have a ton of turnover with a lot of people who are in the technician role. Um, and so when somebody left, like Jian Lin left and Declan took over, it was really easy to kind of um, coordinate people as they were moving, you know, because they have their own careers and their own lives. This is the way that you can make it easiest for them. Like, I need this by this day. I don't care what day you do it, but if you can get it done by August 1st, that would be great. Um, so yeah, that was fantastic and, and really helpful. And these are some members of the team that helped with this. Um, tip number four is to know your field. Um, so one of my most cited papers is actually a review paper in Science Robotics, uh, which came out because because of all the early reviews I'd written in the space, I was very familiar with the folks in my space of biohybrid um, you know, soft robots or soft robots that use biological tissue to move and walk around. And, you know, whenever I saw them at conferences or seminars, they made a point of like reaching out to them, talking to them, getting to know them, following them on Twitter, such that, um, you know, we organized a workshop together at an IEEE conference um, in Hawaii, which was nice because I got to go to Hawaii for free. Uh, but also at that conference, because it went well and we had a lot of stuff to talk about, we decided to put together this review, invited review in science robotics that one of the authors, um, this person, Leonardo Riccati, had a connection to. And, you know, it just ended up having a ton of citations and is kind of a go-to guide for the field now, especially as it grows. And I'm lucky because everybody else in this picture um, is a professor. Um, and so I kind of, as like the youngest person, um, academically in that field get to be counted among those people and they see me as like a more senior person in the field and that's been super helpful and and I think that that's something that you can't discount because these are the people whether you write a review paper with them or not they're going to be the ones reviewing your papers or your grants or inviting you to speak at conferences so regardless of you know how you feel about them as an individual if you can establish a collegiate 
collegial and professional relationship with them, it can make a big difference. Um, all right, tip number five is to market your work. Um, and I think that this can seem really intimidating to people, but it's actually not super hard. Most of the time, your university is seeking news that they can share about impactful research that's being done. So if you spend years working on something, don't just publish it somewhere and you know, forget about it or hope that the few experts in your field are gonna see it. Like find out who are the people um, at your university who write the news articles, be friendly with them, meet with them and send them a note or have your advisor send them a note being like, we did this thing. Um, my stuff, it's a little bit easier because it's like robots or medical devices. So it's pretty easy to like figure out what the hook is to sell it to the public. Um, but even if you do something that feels more fundamental or farther removed from the applications, you know, think about every time you write a grant, the government or some foundation is giving you money for a reason because eventually this will have an impact on like energy or you know sustainability or whatever it is um so figure out you know start from that big picture and figure out how to contextualize your research and, and talk to the general public about your work um and then make sure that every time somebody asks you you know these are some really nice opportunities that I had, you know, with BBC or NPR or MIT News, but I've also done a ton of articles and blogs and things with smaller news organizations or stuff that not as many people read or local news organizations, especially in the beginning of my career, which helped me hone my craft um, and also made me prepared, you know, when I'm not saying no, I'm not saying no to all these things so that when these big opportunities come up, um, I'm prepared and I have a good story to tell um, and I also have a track record of talking to the public. So I think that this is really, really important. Um, even if your advisor doesn't do this, but you see other people in your field doing it well, kind of observe how they do it um, and figure out what that process is like. Um, in addition to marketing your work, it is also really important to market yourself. Um, one big mistake that I see people um, grad students and postdocs doing is that they identify themselves so closely with their area of research which makes sense, it is our entire lives, um, but it's not you. And so if you're only publicizing your research, but not you, um, if you change your research, which you might do during your postdoc or your faculty, um, or you have other aspects of yourself that are equally important or um, important to share with the world so they get a full picture of you, people don't know that. Um, and so I think it's really important to think of those as two separate tips. Yes, it is important to market your research, communicate it, write blogs about it, talk to the news about it, whatever you can do, but also build and cultivate a reputation for yourself outside of those papers. Um, the way that I do this is primarily through social media. Um, so I'm very active on, you know, I have a website. Uh, it's fairly simple. It's kind of a dynamic version of my CV. Um, I'm very active on Twitter. That's the place where I think I started. Um, Twitter is where I find, at least in my field, um, most of my peers and all also a lot of the assistant and associate professor level folks, as well as some senior professors. Um, but there are also a ton of journalists, um, publishers, and those kind of people, people who want to learn about the news, who want to report about it, who might want to ask you your comment on something, um, that look to that look to Twitter to find key opinion leaders in a field. Um, so if you were going to start social media, that is where I would recommend the most um, for uh, cultivating your own reputation as a scientist. Um, I've also found that LinkedIn, you know, keeping in touch with like broad networks of people that you've met over a certain period of time, um, and to an extent Twitter, which is more for, I think, peers or younger women in STEM or other um, people who are looking up to you as a role model to show up and see you as a person in science. Especially, I think, you know, in these current times, I've noticed that my friends who have research that impacts public health a little bit more um, have been super active on Instagram because that's a way to engage with a different audience than you would on Twitter, where it tends to be a little bit more specialized to people who are already kind of in the realm of your sphere. Um, the other thing that's really important related to this um, is to, you know, look out for awards prizes you know johns hopkins has a great database of fellowships and other things that are available to people but if you're on twitter and other these other social media you'll see that there are other prizes that people are winning whether it's like $20, um, no money at all, or like giving a talk, um, it all adds up and helps you cultivate a reputation as an expert in your field. And if you have enough, you have enough recognition, then people start reaching out to you for opportunities, you know, or nominating you for bigger things. So two things that have happened to me during my postdoc as a result of me building up my Twitter um, during um, my PhD 
are, uh, you know, being nominated to the Forbes 30 under 30 list and the MIT Tech Review 35 under 35 list. Those are really big for me, um, have been very great for my career. Um, and being nominated for those kind of, you know, you need several people of note to nominate you. So the more that you can have like a very recognizable story to tell, um, the easier it becomes. And, you know, beyond these awards, I've also had uh, other opportunities come to me because of Twitter. I mentioned that I wrote a book recently for MIT Press that's actually targeted at a general audience, not a scientific audience. And I got it primarily because um, an acquisitions editor for MIT Press followed me on Twitter for a couple years and saw me post a couple blog posts for the National Grad Sui or like Women in Academia blog or something else. He was like, hey, you're a good writer. Do you want to write a book? Um, and so I did. Um, and these are the sorts of things where if you weren't out there and if you weren't making a name for yourself, like nobody is going to come out of their way to knock on your door and find you. You have to be like, hi, I'm here. This is what I like. This is what I'm good at. This is what I do. And then maybe they'll be like, oh, I need somebody to do this. Let me ask so and so. Um, so this one's a really, a really big tip, as you can tell. Um, and then I think this is my second to last one. Um, learn from others. As I mentioned, I've only been doing this for seven years, so I obviously have a lot to learn, especially considering the fact that my current advisor is the most cited engineer in history. Um, big shoes, big shoes to fill, and I am not sure I'll ever fill them. Um, but, you know, in imitating them, I did learn a lot from them. So a lot of the things I've learned about Culti like marketing my research and cultivating a brand for myself separately. I learned from my PhD advisor, uh, Professor Rashid Bashir, who's currently the Dean of Engineering at Illinois. Um, he was such a huge mentor for me and would always be the person, you know, when I was kind of like more pathologically shy as a first year grad student, dragging me to like meet people at conferences and being like, this is the person who was first author on that paper I was, you were talking to me about. Um, and that's why my field and Ended up knowing me and recognizing me as an expert because he always pushed me rather than himself um, forward as an expert. So if you have that in an advisor, that's great. If you don't have that in an advisor, that's also fine because there are plenty of other professors who are in your field who are maybe younger or might have something that they, you know, find really um, they identify with in you um, who would be willing to do that for you. Um, and I found that in a lot of other people as well. Um, and of course, for my postdoc advisor, um, Bob Langer, I've learned a lot um, specifically about this aspect of like, it, it's not going to be impactful unless it's hard. <laughs> so like you have to work on things that are hard and seem like they aren't going to work and won't work for three years. But the way that you mitigate the risk is to work on a couple of those things at the same time. And that's a lesson that um, has been really, really helpful for me and something that I think about as I um, plan on establishing my own lab. So those are big. Um, and then the final tip is to just keep going. Papers come in waves. Um, this is me chillaxing, I think, earlier this summer when I was kind of struggle busing and not able to go to lab. Um, but as I mentioned, you know, you know, at the end of my PhD, I had a ton of papers come out and then it like cut off because I was starting in an entirely new field and entirely new projects. And now I kind of feel that wave coming again, but I know that it's going to stop when, it, you know, if and when I establish a lab, it's going to take me some time to set up a fridge and buy some reagents and do all of these things. Um, so it's important to remember that it's really a long con, it's really a marathon. And eventually somebody is going to be looking at your career from like a 20 or 30 year lens. Um, and they're going to look at that impact holistically. So even if you're having a rough year, especially this year, papers aren't going where they're supposed to be going or you're not getting experiments done, like join the boat, right? Like we're all in this together. And I think everyone's going to see their citation counts kind of go through a little bit of a blip after this, but that's fine. It happens, except maybe the computational people. Well, they might be, they might be happy. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to have a slide kind of summarizing all of the tips. Um, and I would just wanted to say that if I had to pick one of these, um, tip number three, building a multidisciplinary team is the biggest one. Um, you just can't, you can't like, when I think of most of my papers, the ones that have been cited the most, there was no way the amount of time that it would have taken me to become a vet tech that would have been good at doing endoscopy on a pig without having it vomit all over my shoes would have taken me 10 years. Somebody already spent 10 years learning how to do that so that I didn't have to. Um, and so having that team is what makes good papers and good research stand out um, because it relies on the expertise of a lot of different people. So if you're only gonna pick one thing to remember, that would be the one that I would suggest. All right, um, and maybe I'll leave this slide up in case anyone has any questions because this is all my social media. Um, if we don't get to your question today or you think about something 
um, later on that you want to say, I'm happy to talk um, at a different venue. All right. Okay. Oh, they finally unmuted me. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Raman. Uh, that was actually a wonderful talk and all the tips. I mean, I can already see how those, um, you know, tips and strategies kind of helped you get where you are today. And hopefully whoever joined, uh, we have 15 participants um, got to just absorb all that information and actually they're all able to implement it in the near future. But um, I just realized that when, when we started the talk, I didn't even like properly introduce you. We were just kind of talking about grad suite and things like that. But from the flyer, everybody already knows and now you've uh, discussed it. You are a postdoctoral fellow at MIT and you've been named to Forbes 30 under 30, MIT 35 innovators. Um, and, and you just have so many other extracurricular activities that are kind of going on in parallel with the research um, that you do and the expertise that you're trying to build in soft robots. Um, and uh, I guess I can start with one question that kind of uh, stands out to me is that, you know, like, as of today, you have X number of publications and so many citations, and uh, you're probably in the near future looking to um, apply for professor positions in different universities. So how um, important is this one factor in getting those positions, especially getting those positions in universities where you actually want uh, to start your career? And, and are there other parameters that are equally important or more important? Like, yeah, what's your take on that? Yeah, um, so I would say that it's definitely one of the most important things. Obviously, I don't, I haven't signed on the dotted line on the job yet, um, but I have several friends who have, and I've also gotten feedback from a lot of people on different aspects of my faculty package. So I feel like I can say this with some amount of um, certainty. Um, I would say it's probably the most, if not the top two um, things that people are going to look at in your faculty package. Um, and another important thing to note is that some people might have huge citation numbers and huge H indexes because they work in labs where people collaborate a lot and their co-author on a lot of things or their advisor is super famous. Um, and while that is helpful, the, the thing that people most often look for, are the things that you are first author or second author. Um, and so one thing that I did during my PhD, and you know, people can say whether that was a good thing or a bad thing, but I specifically didn't spend time on any project um, unless I was going to be second author or first author on it or co-first. Um, and there were many things where I was second, um, but then did I knew that if I did a certain amount of work, I would be co-first. And so I really pushed to do enough work to be counted for that. Um, and I've had people do that to me as well. I've had several things where people who are more junior to me ended up doing a ton of surgeries or whatever it was for the work. And I was like, of course, like, let's give these people second um, co-first author. Um, so for me, I would say uh, that strategy has been very effective. And I'm not saying it's not good to help help people, but I do think that everything adds up. Um, and at the end of the day, people are only going to look at the things where you were a leader or had like a significant independent contribution um, to the work and to the IP that came out of it especially if your work is like translatable in any way. Um, so that's the biggest thing. However, I do, I have seen people get faculty positions um, at MIT and, you know, other really great schools where they don't have, um, you know, especially in the biology fields or anything, a huge amount of paper, a huge amount of citations, um, or even particularly high impact work, um, but they have strong work, which they then write an incredibly innovative um, research plan and proposal with and something that's very unique to them isn't related to their advisors and shows they really have a vision for this field and a fundamental understanding of the work. Um, I, a couple people specifically come to mind, I, I won't mention them by name, um, but you know there's a professor who ended up taking off um, several years and kind of 
postponing her PhD because she had a few kids and she wanted to spend time with them. And so she didn't have that many papers when she applied um, to faculty positions, but she sent me her faculty materials. And when I read that proposal as compared to others that I've read from peers in the field, I can see that it was incredibly well thought out um, and incredibly impactful. Um, and so I think you can counteract it with those things, but it is the, the number one thing that, that people look for. Hmm. Makes sense. Okay, thank you. Um, anybody else has any questions? Uh, you can always type your questions in chat and uh, then Abe will unmute you. I think Ishita has one. Yeah, yeah I, I got a, quite, quite a few questions. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so I think my first question would be, since like you're working on robotics and stuff, I bet like your work kind of, um, as you talked about IP could develop a lot of patents as well. Mm -hmm. What's your take on having high impact papers versus patents and how have you seen this field of biomedical uh, particularly favor one or the other mm -hmm. um, in terms of progressing through the field? Yeah, um, no, I think that's a, that's a great point. Um, I would say, you know, again, it obviously really depends on your career trajectory. I think for academia, papers still matter more. However, um, one thing that I felt especially, and this is maybe very specific to Boston, um, but because I'm in, you know, the most translational lab in the world that's based in Boston and is right in Kendall Square, which is like the heart of biotech startups, the value of patents has really been kind of like hammered into my skull a lot primarily because it's an out, right? Like if I don't end up going into academia, but some of my work is really translatable and I have a strong protection of my intellectual portfolio, I could start my own company or work um, to have it acquired by a larger company um, on this, on you know whatever type of technology. So it's like one thing is like, it's an out. It's also an out if you decide to go into IP protection or into venture capital or something else, just understanding that that aspect of publishing your research so scientists can understand versus publishing your research so that somebody else can't capitalize on it are two very different things. Um, so it's a good skill set to develop. Um, I've also seen, um, and again, maybe this is specific to the Boston area, but maybe not, at least in BME, I think it's overall, um, because academia is so competitive now, it just doesn't feel enough most of the time to be like, oh, I taught a great class, I published a few great papers, and here's my lab of five students, right? That's how all our, our advisors got tenure. Um, it worked for them. It's clearly not working for any of us. And especially if you want to buy a house in any of these cities, like you need additional sources of income and, and things like that. And so I've definitely been, see, I've seen like translation, you know, every young like biotech and BME professor that I know um, is either consulting for startups, is like key opinion leader for a couple VC firms that they have good relationships with, um, or is, you know, in a translational setting, conducting human clinical trials, having partnerships with corporate or pharma, um, having corporate uh foundation grants from like Bill and Melinda Gates. Um, and it, all of that stuff is contributing to their tenure too. Too. So in addition to their papers, they're also like, here is the stuff that I'm doing to translate my work into the real world um, and all of the other stuff that I'm doing. Um, so at least, again, I, I because I have a limited view of, you know, I haven't been a postdoc in a ton of places, I've been a postdoc in one place. Um, but I would say for me, I haven't prioritized patents too, too much, um, but I kind of wish I had spent more learning about the business side of science rather than just the academic side, um, because I do feel like it gives you an advantage and an edge, not only as a scientist, but also as a human being that's thinking about like ways to earn more money and put down payment down on a house. It's like very practical, but true. Like you need to do all these things. Right. Um, my next question is, since you mentioned that like, you kind of want to also pay attention to these like diverse things. So um, while you moved on from your PhD to your postdoc, mm -hmm. what were the few things you had in mind? Like what was your strategy in choosing the next lab or yeah. like next big thing? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, so one thing that you should know about the faculty application process is that the one question you will never get away from um, in anything is how are you different from your PhD advisor and how are you different from your postdoc advisor. Um, so I needed to, I was a little bit lucky in that I've had a lot of flexibility because of independent funding to do whatever I wanted during my PhD and my postdoc and I was the only person in the lab working on those things and my advisors were old enough and senior enough that they were just kind of like take it we don't care like we're already famous. Um, so that's great. But 
um, regardless, you need to show that you are separate from two people. And the easiest way to do it, at least um, people, different people do it different ways. The way I did it was to just switch fields, because if you can combine insights from like tissue engineering and robotics with insights from smart synthetic materials and implantable devices, which were things that I was interested in, I'd never done animal studies. I'd, you know, hadn't really made an implantable device or a material, uh, synthesized my own material chemistry before. So I was like, I need those skills for my future lab, which I think I want to be in this space. So it's easy for, for me to be like, I took this aspect from them and this aspect from them, and I'm doing this whole different thing that neither of them and neither of their labs does. And nobody questions. I mean, there's 150 people in Bob Langer's lab, um, many of whom do drug delivery, which is the thing that he is the most famous for. Um, but most of the time, people don't question why I am different from the other 150 people or why I'm different from Bob, because I've made it fairly obvious based on the fact that I have this additional area of expertise that's very different from what I'm doing during my postdoc. However, I will say that the one caveat with that um, is that it is very risky and that there is a big learning curve. Um, so the risky part is that you're just doing something completely different. So like you're not sure that your skills are transferable. Um, I also did a kind of stupid thing, which I wouldn't recommend to others. It worked out for me because I got two great papers out of my postdoc so far, but the two papers were in two completely different fields. Um, and so for the first few years, I was like, not only am I learning something completely different for my PhD, I'm doing it in two, like two different things. And I felt so stupid for the first two years of my postdoc because there were first year grad students who knew more about this topic than me. And I'm supposed to be like, Dr. Raman, right? You're a first year grad student. Nobody cares if you don't know anything when you're a first year postdoc and you don't know anything, like you just feel stupid. Um, especially when you felt like an expert two months ago. Um, so that's something that I would maybe not recommend. I've seen some people do it a little bit more effectively where they either only just work on one entirely new thing or they work on two things, but one's entirely new and another one is more closely tied to their PhD. And so they can publish kind of earlier. Um, so that can be helpful. It also affects your publication timelines. Generally people recommend if you go do a post Postdoc, don't apply to faculty until you have at least one published paper from your postdoc. So if you have something that's easier to do or shorter term, you can start applying for faculty things sooner. Whereas for me, it took me two years to get my first paper out from my postdoc because it was a large animal study in pigs. That's just how long it takes. Um, so yeah, that's, you know, kind of lessons and takeaways. Um, hopefully that answered your question. <laughs> yes, um, thank you. Um, one very small question. Um, what do you think about like reviewing the papers for journals? Like how important is that for a career trajectory, especially considering if academia is the goal? Yeah, um, it's something I have on my CV. I think it's something that people notice. I don't know how important it is, um, but you know, there's so much of the academia that's a black box, so it's hard to tell. I don't know why I started getting, like I started getting review requests fairly early in my grad student career. And I think it was because my boss was too busy and would just like tell the journal to send it to me instead. Um, and instead of having me write it under his name, he was very nice about sending it to me so that I could submit it under my name. And so I have reviewed for some really big journals um, and really big, you know, NSF, SBIR grants, MERSEC grants, like big things. Um, so that's been very helpful um, personally and just sort of knowing the field, knowing the players. And I think, I think because most of the journal editors are also people inviting people to invited talks at conferences or seminars, I think it does have an impact. I haven't seen it tangibly. I haven't seen somebody say it's because of this or I noticed this on your CV. Nobody's ever said it to me. Um, but I have a sense that it's probably important and that people just know. If you're getting an article that's like, very tailored to you, then you know that people in the field that you don't even know, know who you are and the kind of work you do, which probably means they're citing your paper and they, you know, might invite you to do something in the future. So it's not a bad thing. Um, and if you're getting too many and it seems like too much work, then just pick the highest impact journals. Right. So it's kind of important for the visibility you need in some aspect. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. It was great presentation. And thank you so much for answering all my questions. Of course, thank you for having so many questions. Um, oh, I see Abe has a question about review papers. Um, yeah, so I think this is great. You know, I think I've probably written more um, than most. Um, and I wouldn't, okay, so <laughs> review papers, book chapters, they're good, but they don't count that much. 
right? So you have to really think about how you spend your time. Um, I've probably written more than I would have wanted to, but at the end of the day, like there's a couple review papers that I have to write that I'm kind of kind of like, eh. And I actually just told my boss, Bob, that I, I couldn't do one right now because I have so much other stuff going on that I'm like really overwhelmed. Um, but there were other things where it was like, in science robotics or in advanced materials, which are so huge in my field that I was like, you absolutely have to make time for this. Um, especially when either it's with 10 people who are the rock stars in your field or like for the advanced materials one, it was invite, It was an invited review. The person writing it is a professor at Harvard Medical School that I may wanna ask for a job from one day or like some kind of recommendation from. And they wanted me to write it with Bob. So it'd be like for two Ram and Robert Langer, right? That's like, oh, like I want <laughs> that, that um, paper. So for the most part, I tend to say yes to them. Um, but there have been times, I mean, I've started saying no to some things like the one I said no to is in a good journal. It's a really good journal. I just can't do it right now. Um, and because it would compromise the amount of time I can spend on my first author work. And right now I'm starting to think about papers where I'm corresponding author as well and like writing grants for my future lab. So I just know that that's not a priority, especially since I have so many other review papers um, to back back off on and there's also only so much you can say about a field right like how many times can I write this like I've told you this is where it is and we haven't made any huge leaps in the last year um so I mean I, it's kind of a wishy-washy answer I would say in the beginning of your career never say no to anything um but once you get in a certain place where you're a little more established you can start pruning and thinking about unless this is a high impact journal um is this worth my time um and yeah I, I would say one thing about review papers I don't think it matters as much to be first author. Um, it helps when there's just only a few authors. In that science robotics one, I wasn't first author, but I'm not super caught up about it because it's like 10 people, the nine of whom are really well-established professors. So like the fact that I'm in the middle of that author list, I mean, it is what it is. One day you'll be at the top of that author list or at the, I guess at the last, that's where you wanna be, um, but either way. Um, so yeah, pick your battles, I think is how I would address that. Yeah, that's really good. Thank you. Basically, just don't say no in your first couple years, like not important enough to, I'm barely important enough to, I'm just old and tired. It's been a rough year. <laughs> um, I, I have a follow-up question to, um, that. I guess my question is related with the fact that, you know, as you keep progressing in your career, you have multiple things now that you are doing with this, um, uh, I guess, in comparison to when you were just starting out your PhD, you were mostly in yeah. lab, writing was not even, you know, like in the picture. Um, yeah. But as you progress, you kind of get a knack of um, writing at the same time, like doing your lab work more efficiently and productively, mm -hmm. but still, uh, there's you know I, I personally struggle with this thing a lot that when I'm writing I feel like I'm not doing enough lab work and when I'm in lab I'm, I feel like I'm missing out on my writing so like how do you uh, balance those two um, I guess it depends on every person how do, how they how they take it but I guess any tips from your side yeah no that's fantastic I think that's a really really important time and of course everybody has to discover like what works best for them in terms of the amount of time they dedicate to things or what chunk of time they can focus. Yeah. Um, but I can just share what works for me. Um, so I tend to, uh, the thing that works best for me, especially during, <laughs> during the pandemic. Um, so you're right that I don't, most of my time is actually not spent doing lab work. It's either mentoring other students, um, doing meetings with clinical collaborators, writing grants, um, doing faculty related things. Um, so I would say that I kind of do what a professor does, but I also do in lab work, which is exhausting. So I would love to be eventually a professor so I can stop spending as much time pipetting. Um, the thing that works best for me is having the same set time to do all of those things. And like I, you know, people ask me for meetings all the time and you probably noticed in a few times that we've met that I suggested evening times. It's because late afternoon and evening, um, unless it cannot be avoided, is the only time that I have meetings. Um, more early mornings I spend in lab and then I uh, come home, shower because COVID. Um, and then I have writing time. So I do lab for, I wake up pretty early. I wake up at six. I'll like have breakfast, do yoga, go to lab for two to three hours, come back. 
um, write. And in the middle of that writing block, I'll have like our lunch and tea break. Um, and then I start doing meetings with the exception of this one, which is a little bit earlier. Um, but for the most part, I'll start doing meetings around like three to 6 p.m. And then I do dinner and then like work on other stuff depending on, on what that day is. And I do not deviate from that schedule unless mm -hmm. there is a huge reason to. So like here, it makes sense to have a webinar at a certain time, I get it. Um, but for the most part, you know, if somebody, unless they're like the Dean of engineering at like a top 10 school and they're like, I can only meet you at 9 a.m., which I've had those meetings, I show up at 9 a.m. But for right now, because I'm the most senior person in a lot of the interactions that I have, or I'm talking to professors who have like a little more flexibility in their schedule, I'm like, I can meet between three and six on weekdays, let me know. <laughs> um, so for me, the thing that's most important is consistency and chunking. There are other times like during my dissertation, my brain works best in the morning. Um, and I was doing experiments that were fairly routine, so I flipped it. Um, I would do all of my writing from like 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. Um, and then I would do like a lunch break, do afternoon lab work. And at that point in time, I was, I think, a senior year, uh, senior grad student. I didn't have as many meetings. Um, so that was, those were kind of all over the place. But as a postdoc, this is what's um, worked best. I will say there's one exception, which is when I was writing my book, I could not write in like one to two hour bursts um, because you're thinking about like a you know, tens and tens of thousands of words and how to fit into a certain style. Um, so those are things where I actually dedicated like a couple weeks at a time to only working on the book. So mm. that's what works for me. Okay, awesome. I guess that's all for me. Thank you so much, Olivia. Anybody else? Any questions? This is your chance. <laughs> well, this is also uh, Dr. Dr. Raman, I just want to thank you on behalf of mm -hmm. Grad Suite for taking time out of your busy schedule to, yeah. to give us this webinar. And I know all of us learned quite a, quite a lot from all of the tips that you gave us. Um, I especially, um, it really made me think of a different way of how to like plan like my experiments and like my papers and all that. Um, I really like the approach that you take. Um, and I'm definitely going to take that into account with my own own work. Um, That's great. If anyone yeah. has, sorry. No, I'm just, I'm glad. And, you know, if you guys have any things that worked for you or didn't work for you, please let me know. Cause I feel like I advise young people on this all the time, but I just tell them what works for me and maybe it doesn't work for everyone. So I would rather know that than not. Oh, and Ishita, I just saw your question. Um, I think it, so I would think that I see that a lot in biology, not so much in biomedical engineering or mechanical engineering, which are more of my fields. Um, but I think if you were going to do a second postdoc, it would have to be for the reason that it's like an incredibly famous person or a person who has a really good track record of sending people to academia or to industry or whatever track you want, or it's in a city that you want. Um, yeah, I, I really hate how long this postdoc process is. Um, not because I don't think it's important. I just think it's like a ridiculous way to take people who are incredibly well educated and pay them minimum, like the minimum possible wage that you could give them um, for extended periods of time. So I would say avoid it if you can, but if you see like a strong strategic advantage, then maybe it makes sense. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you all. And feel free to reach out if you have more questions. Will do, yeah. Everybody has Dr. Raman's um, email ID, you know, all the ways to contact her on Twitter and other places. So feel free to do that. Thank you so much for your time. And uh, yeah. yeah, hopefully we'll meet one day. <laughs> yeah, that'd be awesome. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to add that um, the video will be available. It takes a little while for Zoom to get that up. So whenever that's okay. available, I'll send that along with all of Dr. Raman's info on how to contact her. So you can have that too. Thank you. Right. Awesome. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Bye-bye.